All right, welcome to our August 2023 IJIG Lunch and Learn. Today we have Jessica Fry with Geocom here. She's the GIS project manager for Geocom and basically our go to person for all things Next Gen 911 in the state of Iowa, or at least she's who I pepper all my questions to. Um, so I'll let Jessica uh, introduce herself and uh, kind of bring everyone up to date with what's been going on with regards to Next Gen 911 in the state of Iowa and where things are going in the next year or so. So go ahead. And if you do have questions, um, you can, if you're comfortable popping in and asking those questions, go ahead. If not, put them in the chat. I'll manage the chat and um, pop in with those questions if anyone has them. And just a reminder, we are recording this presentation and we will make it available on our IJIC YouTube channel um, afterwards. So go ahead, Jessica, thank you and welcome. Thank you, Micah, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, my name is Jessica Fry. I'm the GIS project manager for the state of Iowa, Next Gen 911 um, GIS quality control aggregation part of the project. So, um, I wanted to cover really three main topics today. One is the project web map or the dashboard for the state so that everybody knows where it is, what it is, et cetera, um, where you can find it. Briefly talk about the Next Gen 911 GIS standard update that is currently going on. Then talk briefly about the Iowa Critical Incident Mapping Project because some of you may have heard about that, may have questions, may want more information. I am not the project manager of that project, but if there's any questions that come up, I'm happy to take those down and get back to you or have Ethan um, Creedle, who is the project manager, do that for you. So in the um, PowerPoint here is my contact information. I believe probably most of you on the call have this information, but I wanted to make sure that it was included here. So if you ever have any questions about the Next Gen 911 project, feel free to reach out to me via email or my phone number, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And I probably should have put the Iowa team email address on here, but those of you who submit to GIS Data Hub, I'm sure you are uh, super familiar with what that email address is. Okay, so the first topic here that I want to cover is the Next Gen 911 dashboard or web map. It is available to everyone. Blake has sent this link out in all of the past emails over, I believe, about the last five or six months, maybe even longer than that. It is updated once a week on Monday. So everything that is submitted and processed through from one Monday to the following Monday at whatever time it's updated um, is reflected here. So I wanted to kind of give a breakdown of the information and then I'm actually gonna stop um, my PowerPoint presentation and, and go to the dashboard so that I can show you around in that. At the very top is the title of the map. It does tell you the last time it was updated, not only the date, but the time of the update. Keep in mind, it doesn't necessarily mean all of the counties processed on that day is through that time. I try my best to get them, but sometimes they sneak in on me. And then I do also provide a date of when the next update is. Again, it is on a Monday unless a Monday is a holiday and then it may be on a Tuesday or we may update it the Friday prior. The green box at the top left under the title is the number of jurisdictions that have or counties that have met the benchmark in the current month. So right now you're seeing August, 86 of them, keeping in mind that this is as of Monday, out of 99 have submitted and they are critical air free. Below that is a list of the counties that have submitted. So while a county may have submitted, if they have critical errors, they are not included in that 86. As an example, and thank you, Lynn County, for uh, having this be a possibility of this um, uh, presentation today, because it's not normally this way, but Lynn County did submit, I believe it, they have one critical error that they need to resolve. Once that's resolved, then they will turn green. 
Now, if you are wanting more information about your jurisdiction or another jurisdiction, if you're just curious, you can click on the individual counties and it will give you the GIS accuracy, when they submitted, alley to road center line, alley to site structure address point. And then also it will provide the information for the month prior. So you will see when I get to the, to the dashboard that it does give you who was submitted in July. Everyone submitted in July, everyone met the benchmark. So everyone is a yes, of course, but you do have that option to go back one month prior since the uh, submission rate has now changed to monthly. So with that being said, um, I am going to put up the dashboard here so I can show you. Um, Micah or someone else on the call, can you tell me, did it change over to the actual dashboard? Yep, it looks like it did. Very good. So again, you have the title, you have the number of counties that have submitted and met the benchmark, you have a list of the counties that have submitted in alphabetical order, and then you can uh, click on any one of these counties to get additional information. As an example, um, not to pick on Story County, but I am going to do that for presentation purposes. When I click on Story, it does give me their accuracy their alley to road center line, alley to site structure address points, if they had any critical errors in their last submission, did they meet the Q4 benchmark? So that was last quarter because now we're monthly. And then did they submit in July? Did they meet the benchmarks? And then August. Absolutely. Micah, could you uh, give everyone the link even though it will be in the, the recording? Uh, one of the other things that I want to make sure that everybody is aware of is there are two different data layers here just for symbology purposes. So if you click next, you're really seeing the same information. So you don't necessarily have to go to the second feature, but that is an option there if, if you choose to do it. So it's a pretty simple um, dashboard. We pr try to provide as much information as possible within it without giving you information overload, but it is available to you. Again, it's updated every Monday. If you are wanting to check the status, I would um, definitely take a look at that date and time. If it's not um, the current Monday, please come back either on a Tuesday morning or later on the Monday. Um, you're welcome, Matt, for reminding you you needed to submit. Um, any questions on the dashboard? I just want to say again, I really love having that feedback every month. Just kind of as a, even though it says you're doing okay, it's nice to see that, that you guys think that we're meeting those benchmarks so that we can move on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that reminds me, I did want to mention that I don't have it in this presentation, um, but we do send out email reminders when there's two weeks left within the month. So um, those of you who have not yet submitted or you do not yet meet the benchmark, an email will go out to you approximately two weeks prior to the end of the month to remind you that you need to submit. If there are any counties that have not submitted by the last week of the month, we will send out another reminder. So not only do we provide you this this dashboard, but we are actively reaching out to those counties that have not um, yet submitted and met the benchmarks. And I apologize here, I am going to have to look at something real fast because I think my slides got out of order. So give me just a moment. Sorry about that. No problem, well, we're a pretty casual group, Jessica. Well, I will tell you, I am not sure what happened to my slides, so I am just going to roll right into the data standards document. Um, are you able to see the Word document on the screen now? Okay, yep. thank you, Micah. Okay. So um, most of you are probably very aware that the NINA NextGen 911 data model was recently updated. There was a version two, 
they did some additional updates that were minor that didn't change the contact uh, content of the document. So 2A is the most current version and they're actually working on or getting ready to work on version three. There were a couple of areas that were uh, modified or updated in the MENA Next Gen 911 data model that did require us to begin updating the Iowa standard. Now, be aware what I'm showing you today is the draft and um, Blake and John and Jensen and team are working on getting a group of people to discuss it uh, more in depth. But I did at a high level want to just really talk about what are those big items that you are going to see changed. The first one is the MENA Next Gen 911 Global Unique ID. And I'll go to that section in a moment and explain what those changes are. The other thing that you are going to find is that the um, boundary layers are no longer called emergency boundary or emergency service boundaries. They have now shortened it for um, the fire law and EMS to service boundaries. So you have a fire service boundary, law service boundary, EMS service boundary. What does that mean for you all? It really doesn't mean much of anything, except that if you're reading the standard, you're going to see a different name. You do not have to change the name of your layers. You can keep on um, submitting them just like they are, but be aware that those officially have changed names. The other thing when it comes to name changes, and you'll see it here under, under item six, is that the state, county, incorporated municipality, and then if you would go on down to unincorporated community, neighborhood community, et cetera, the official name of those layers have changed from what you and I would probably think common terminology as in state or county, parish, incorporated municipality, to A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, et cetera. The reason for that change is the alignment to the I3 standard, which is the call routing portion of Next Gen 911. Again, you are not going to have to rename your fields. You're not gonna to have to rename your data layers. Just keep in mind that they do have those new um, layer names. Finally, with the layers, um, there wasn't any additional fields added, but one of the things that they did is they changed the requirements of the fields or the attributes from mandatory, optional, conditional to required, yes, no, and conditional. So anything that used to be optional is now required, no. Anything that was mandatory is required, yes. So you will see that also reflected in the standard. Again, you all really don't have to do anything to your data unless you choose to do it. Um, at this point, I don't think we would recommend any updates to your local schema. So with that being said, I am going to uh, go scroll, and I apologize for scrolling here pretty quickly, but I want to get to um, a couple of things. The first one, here is the official layer name in the NINA Next Gen 911 data model. You can see they took out the spaces or underscores. Instead of RCL, it's road center line. For EMS fire law, it's fire polygon, police polygon, EMS polygon, et cetera. Wanted to provide that information to you. Again, no changes need, it, need to be made at the local level. Here is the portion once it is submitted on the required yes, no, and then again, of course, conditional. Um, okay, Nina next in 911, um, Nina globally unique IDs. This is probably going to be the biggest change that will need to occur in the data set. With that being said, Geocom through GIS Data Hub is able to assist in creating this new globally unique ID needed for NextGen 911. 
some of you, it is the case where you have only a number or a global ID or some other part for your local unique ID. We add the layer indicator to it and the agency identifier to it. So some of you were already doing that. Some of you, you have RCL underscore your local ID at the agency identifier. It is your choice once this is approved, do you want to populate that field yourself or do you want to just convert that field to your local unique ID and we, Geocom through GIS Data Hub, will add the URN, the layer indicator and the agency identifier to it. So no, no answers need to be provided right now. Just keep in mind that that is um, going to be the options. With that being said, I have a couple of examples in the standard on what those NGUIDs look like. We are providing this kind of, um, let's say, auto population through GIS Data Hub as a service to you all because as you can see in this first one for the RCL, that NGUID is gnarly looking. Basically, the only thing you all are using locally is that local agency ID. You could probably care less about the URN, layer indicator, and agency identifier. When you have a chance to review it and after this is approved and sent out and all of the discussions are held, we will send out an email notification to each county and ask you which one you would like to do. Again, this is probably the number one biggest change in this next gen 911 data model document. Any questions on, on this one at this point in time? When, what's the time for, when's that likely to have to be implemented? So um, I don't know of any rush, but I know, I believe John Paoli is on the call. Um, John, I don't know if you guys have kind of thought about an estimate. Like I said, you, you're just pulling people together to discuss this and approve it. Correct. Yeah. So, so right now I know Jeff Miller is, is now the, the IJIC rep. And so he's kind of just got into his first meeting with us. So we haven't put a hard and fast date to it. The hope is that in the, in the next few quarters, we kind of get a, a feel for when people think this will be a, a good standard for Iowa, if that makes sense. So with that being said, I, I do not think it will probably be within the next month, probably more, you know, looking down the road. Because it is. It does have to be discussed and it is a 58 page document. So if anything else needs to be updated per Iowa, that will also occur at the same time. Correct. Yep. Um, the other major thing that we wanted to make sure everybody was aware of is for the, um, for the ECRF, well, actually for the Contact Alley 6.0, there were some requirements to have some additional uh, fields added, and those fields are either auto-populated by Geocom through GIS Data Hub, or they are spatially attributed using GIS Data Hub. Those fields were not in the last data model, but they do exist in the final aggregated data set. So we added those to the schema so that everybody was fully aware of um, what those were. If you've downloaded the statewide data set or you've downloaded your critical air free data set under available packages, you will see those additional fields as a part of your data. So we wanted to make sure that those were included. I think, um, John, was there any other overarching topics on the data model that you thought we should cover today? No, uh, the, the 911 community will hear a little more from uh, all the folks that are taking uh, part in that, you know, standard review in, in the coming months. So nothing for today. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. um, so with that being said, um, I've covered the dashboard. I've 
covered the, the main topics of change in the data standard. I did want to ask those of you who use GIS Data Hub, if you all have any questions, um, is there anything that I can take the time today to point out? I did mention available packages. I'm happy to log into GIS Data Hub and, and talk through any of those items if there is anything outstanding. And I know, uh, Micah, there are some people, I think, on the call that are not users of GIS Data Hub. So, um, you know, it, it might be beneficial for them to kind of see what that looks like. I was actually just going to say, I think that's a great idea. You know, some of it's elementary, but we always have new GIS coordinators and maybe walking through the proper way to submit data or at least kind of show that might be a great idea and not make assumptions. Sure, absolutely. So I'm going to apologize ahead of time because I do not remember what my non-administrative username and password is. So <laughs> with that being said, I'm going to log in as an administrator. So y'all are going to get kind of an under the hood look here. Um, that has value too. When we just see our part. It's hard to see what you're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. So um, are you able to see GIS Data Hub now? It has the uh, switch agency. Yes. Okay, very good. So um, I'm just gonna pick on one of our maintenance customers because I can. I could just have picked anyone else. Um, however, we'll just we'll just pick on this county right now. So when you log in, it doesn't matter if it's what you're seeing on my screen or if it's yours. Whatever you have access to, it will drop you onto the submit new data page. On the submit new data page, you have a couple of options. Either you're going to drag and drop your zip file that contains all of your data layers that have been packaged with GIS Data Hub into this page. And once you've submitted it, it will pop up and say, congratulations, or your data has been submitted, one of those two. You can also um, click on it and you can browse to the file. Now, this is an active client, so I am not going to drag and drop any data into this interface. Once your data has been processed, you, the user, whoever has access to GIS Data Hub and is on in notifications, will then receive an email that says um, a couple of things. Either your GIS data has um, fallout, which means you have critical errors to um, remediate or correct, or you're, you are critical error free. When you get those emails, you're going to log back in if you've logged out, or you're going to go to the analytics page. On the analytics page, you're going to have the select data target. There's only one option for Iowa. Once you click that, then you have access to not only the last quality control that was ran, but you also have access to all of the fallout that has, um, has occurred in the past. So, that is down there. It looks like um, this specific county, we're almost one year into using um, the system. For the, la the latest results, there's two options. There's one that says GIS data summary report, and then there's this GIS fallout report. I'm just gonna go to the summary report at, at this moment in time. Keep in mind that the fallout report is what you are going to download and convert to a geodatabase in order to correct any critical errors that you have. It is not going to be super useful to look at this one because it is critical error free and they do not have very many warning errors. So when you click on the summary report, what you are going to see is the um, errors. It lists it or the non-errors, whichever one it might be. It lists it first by layer, the QC name, a lapse time in seconds, fallout count, features analyzed, the sync percentage, and then the QC severity level. All of these headers are sortable. So if I wanted to just see, okay, what quality control checks had fallout? If I click on it once, it's going to go from smallest to largest. If I click on, click on it again, it is going to go from largest to smallest. So as you can see here, all of the checks 
that have fallouts are all within the warning. So at the very top, we have the alley or the telephone number listing of civic addresses to address points, address points to roads, features broken up polygon, alley to road center line, segment snapping, and then again, features broken up polygon. What you can do from here is over on the right hand side, the very last one with the paper that has an arrow to the right, you can download this as a CSV, you can save it, you can send it on if you need to send it to the, to the dispatch manager or the PSAP manager, whomever it is. Um, and you can also choose to turn uh, fields on and off. So as an example, elapsed time in seconds is not super useful to all of you or even me. So I could turn that off if I wanted to. As a side note, elapsed time in seconds is simply telling you how many seconds it took to run that quality control check. This version of GIS Data Hub is very proficient. So for the alley to site structure address points, you can see that it analyzed 2,870 2, features in 2.4 seconds. So it is very quick. Um, most of the time when it's processing the data, after it's done the checks, it's compiling the report, and then of course you get the email. So. QC checks, super proficient. It does take a little bit of time sometimes to uh, get those reports compiled. You can also refresh it if you want. I don't think I've ever hit that button, but it is there. Um, so again, it gives you all of the quality control checks. It gives you all of the fallout. It gives you all the features analyzed um, there in that, um, on that page. Now, I'm going to go to um, the data packages because I'm in an administrative mode, which means that I have account settings, which you all will not have. You do have data packages and dashboards, so I'm going to skip down to the available packages and talk through what you um, will find there. First and foremost, at the very top is a geodatabase that's called Iowa underscore hsemd.gdb.zip. This is your data, your jurisdiction's data in the Iowa NG911 data model format. It again has those added fields, EMS, fire law, et cetera. You can download this, you can take a look at it if you, if you choose to. This is also a reflection of the data that um, you will see reflected in the statewide uh, geodatabase. It's there, it should always be there. As long as you're critical air free, it will have the most current date. Of course, if you have critical errors, it will not replace that geodatabase until you're critical air free again. Under the HSEMD supplied packages, these are um, data, information, tools that we have uploaded to GIS Data Hub. And I actually see we have an old statewide fallout zip file that I need to remove off of there. The first one is the Iowa statewide geodatabase. So this is the aggregated database. It is quite large, so it will possibly take some time to download. You have the end user agreement. So this is the um, PDF that if there's a new user, you would fill it out, send it to the Iowa team here at Geocom. We will then get approval from the state and the state will, um, the state, once they approve it, then we will issue the username and password. We have the schema mapping. So this is the field mapping spreadsheet, basically. Then we have the Hub Helper tool, which is what you currently are using right now to package the data and then convert the results to a geodatabase. With that being said, I will let you know that our development team on GIS Data Hub is working very, very, very hard to have Hub Helper no longer needed. They are doing things like you will be able to submit shape files, although I don't know why you would submit shape files. It's not recommended because nulls don't work in shape files and you have to be um, not have any faces. But anyways, you could submit shape files. Um, it also is going to allow things like a CSV for the alley to be uploaded without having to be within the package, etc. 
the one um, the one obstacle that um, they are going to be dependent on is the ability of GIS Data Hub to natively remove the 999 features. And I know most of you are using 999 to exclude features outside of your provisioning boundary. So keep in mind, once that is implemented, then you will not be required to use Hub Helper to package your data. Um, four ways, three ins or four, Jessica? <laughs> what's that? Is it three nines or four nines? Oh, it's three. Did I say four? No, I think you said three, but I honestly sometimes sit there and can't remember. So I thought this would be the time to ask. Yep, yep, it's just three nines. Um, after they have that, then they'll begin working on the other exception codes so that um, you can use exceptions for warnings, things like um, your address point to road center line is exception, right? Because y'all have even addresses on odd sides, you know, you can't control all your addressing authority. Then um, the last two items here, um, and actually I just uh, I just had a call with somebody this, this morning on this first one. This is the Comtech Alley prep for GIS uh, Data Hub. This should walk you through, if you have access to the Comtech system, how to download the data in um, a CSV format. It will actually not download the wireless VoIP, et cetera, records, and it will let you know what do you need to do to prepare those uh, for submission because there are some, a, a little bit of nuances there. So it's there for you. And then the very last one is a uh, hub helper, or not hub helper, a GIS data hub quick guide. This walks you through everything from packaging your data to submitting it, to getting your results, to using your results. And then also, if you can't wait until Monday to see if you have met the benchmark, it gives you the formulas for you to calculate your overall GIS accuracy from the um, analytics page, that um, GIS summary that we looked at earlier. So that is there also. Um, once the data standard has been approved, um, we'll probably put a copy up here or a link to where you can find it on the state's website. We try to give you all of the needed documentation just in one place. We used to have a landing page. We no longer need the landing page because we do have this um, ability to upload documents. The last one here is the dashboard. So the dashboard gives you a look at critical errors and warning errors. Here it's telling us there's not enough data to display a historic graph because we are on the date range of monthly. If we go and we look at, okay, what, we'll just do the last three months. What is the last three months of submissions look like for the specific county? Then you have the bar chart and when you hover over each of the dots, it does tell you how many critical errors were in the data set for that submission. So you can see as our team has worked through, they've introduced critical errors, they've resolved it, introduced, resolved it, etc. Over on the right hand side, this is the warnings. And again, you can hover over each one of those little circles and you can see the really nice thing is it also tells you how many errors you have resolved since your last submission. So for warnings, um, this specific county has had 23 less warning errors occur. Of course, you do have the help here. You can, you can get the help. Um, you do have the ability to see what user you're logged into. And then of course, you all don't have the nice drop down like I do because I'm in an administrative mode, but this is the jurisdiction that you're logged into. Cause I do know that some of you submit for multiple jurisdictions. That is GIS Data Hub um, overview. Anybody have any questions? It doesn't sound like it. So let me put my PowerPoint back up here. Um, I wanted to talk just briefly, and um, I will apologize in advance 
because again, I am not the project manager on the Iowa Critical Incident Mapping Project, but I was able to get a few slides from Ethan who wasn't able to join us today so that I could kind of give you a little bit of information on it. And I know there's lots of educational sessions um, and other items going out. So for the Iowa Critical Incident Mapping Program, how many, and, and maybe if we can make a use chat, how many of you have heard about this project that is going on in Iowa? If you could just drop a yes in the chat or a no, I'm just really curious to know how many of you have heard about this project. Yeah, Micah, it is cool. It looks like the overwhelming majority of you all have not heard about this, this program. That is, that is good to know. Um, John, let's discuss, maybe we can get a more formal presentation to this group, maybe even next month or something on this project. Yeah, sounds good. I'll drop a, just a URL to the, to the governor's school safety initiative, because it's all kind of boxed into that one large project. I'll put that in chat right now. Jessica, in full disclosure, the only reason I mostly know about it is because like, I post the, the job description that I know is related to this project on the IGIP website. But so, you know, very, yeah. very about it. Awesome. Okay, so yes, I definitely check out what the link that John um, sent. So just um there is a component in here for sharing with public safety and and one of the the neat things is um there's this animated slide in here that ethan provided me so right now without floor prints 3d information from schools in the dispatch center what you're mainly seeing is a location of a call and the phone number that's called it but once these schools are completed and the data is available for use within the dispatch center, you have a whole new world that you can um, look at and open up. This is just an example of when a call comes in, not being able to know specifically where within that footprint that call is coming from versus once you have the information, you then know that the call is coming from the auditorium. So for fire law, EMS, very important to know specifically where these calls are coming from. So that's just a really um, great benefit of this project in and of itself that really um, directly impacts those of you at the, um, that support the dispatch center. Um, I clicked on it again, but I think I just have it going again. Let me see. I need to uh, figure out how to advance. Clicking on the slide is not going to advance it. Okay. So for the data verification and collection, um, the GeoCom team is using ArcGIS field map. They did provide or even provided some screenshots of, of what they're looking for or how what they see when they're going in there. So uh, again, floor plans are the most important. And then while they're on site, they're collecting additional information like cameras, door, doorbells, et cetera. And on the very right of uh, this slide, it does show you um, a screenshot or a picture of the technology that the team is actually using to scan each of the rooms to get that 3D view of it. Um, Again, I am not um, an expert in this area, so we'll definitely get you some additional information out there, but just know that they are actively on site scanning, working with schools, getting the floor plan information and processing that through um, just as quickly as they possibly can. Um, and John, while, while I have this slide up, and I know, thank you for, providing the information on um, the, the jobs that are out there. Again, if you know anybody interested in it, there is some additional opportunities here at GeoCom. But John, you know a lot more about this project. Is there any additional information that you want to talk about for this critical incident mapping program? 
Well, you know, it's 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 worth taking a look at at the link and and understanding, you know, the kind of all the different initiatives um, that are here from the Iowa Department of Education and and Public Safety. Um, our office does, you know, vulnerability assessments, a few other things as it relates to emergency management. But our goal goal with this project was to make sure that whatever you know system we created, it dovetailed with our public service answering points, um, and so that you know public safety and emergency management had these tools at their disposal along with all the other tools we have um, during an emergency. So while we are, HSCMD isn't the primary, uh, the Department of Public Safety is, uh, along with GEOCOM, Department of Education. And, uh, and as this evolves, I would imagine people with, you know, needs uh, to be involved um, can get access to the system if they support emergency management in some capacity. Thank you, John. So with that being said, Micah, I don't have any more content, but I am happy to answer any questions on NextGen 911 or if there's a specific question on the critical incident mapping, I'm happy to, to gather that and, and see what I can come up with for an answer. Um, this is Neil Carpenter with GeoSearch. Can I say a few words about the critical incident mapping project? Can you hear me? Yep, I, Micah, I'm okay with it. Yeah, go I, ahead, Neil. To me. Yeah, no, I was just about to say something, Neil, but go ahead. Um, I was going to ask if anyone else had any comments, so you do. Hit it. Yes, I do. We, uh, um, Jessica, I thought it was a great presentation, and we have been, for the past several months, uh, under contract with GEOCOM to recruit specifically for the field, the Iowa field GIS technician roles, working directly with uh, HR leadership at GEOCOM, and it's been um, uh, quite an effort, uh, we, uh, and we've refined the outreach, and what, I think what we've learned is the sweet spot for this is we it has to be people work, that are currently living in the state of Iowa or have, let's say, a residence or, uh, let's say, parents in the state of Iowa, because that's where all the work is being done, obviously. It involves every public school uh, throughout the state, so it's an, an enormous project. And what we found is the ideal candidate are young people that are have just finished their degrees in geography with an emphasis in GIS per, or, or certification, perhaps, looking to get a, a foot in the door in the GIS uh, world. The fact that this is boots on the ground um, work is very interesting to young people. I'm excited to talk about it with them. And they're excited about the opportunity and then, of course, the opportunity to work with a a respected geospatial company in the public safety space like GEOCOM. And we probably placed about 10 people, but more are needed all over the state of Iowa. So the sort of my comment is anything you can do to spread the word, if you know or have heard from young people that are, are looking, or maybe not necessarily young people, but new to the GIS space that are looking for a foot in the door uh, this is a, these are, uh, they can be temporary positions if somebody, let's say, is looking for an internship, but generally it's a full time opportunity that pivots into a, a full time remote role with GeoCom. So it truly is a foot in the door with a geospatial uh, company. So spread the word. Uh, you, you can apply directly with GeoCom. You can also go to the GeoSearch website because we're doing all the pre screening for candidates for this role sending it on to the, the HR people at GEOCOM. And, you know, and the other thing I'll say is that it, young people really are excited about the opportunity to be, to be about, to be working on a project that has such meaning, you know, the idea of contributing to something that literally uh, potentially is about saving lives. So um, I appreciate your time and uh, spread the word. Let's, let's, get a, let's grow the team and so this project can be completed successful, successfully. Thanks, Neil. Um, does anyone else have any questions for um, Jessica? Well, Jessica, I appreciate you uh, with rather short notice being willing to do this and, and kind of give an update on what's going on with the monthly submissions and some changes coming down the road. It's very timely. Um, it, it, her contact information is at the end of the slide and um, uh, if you'll notice in the chat, anyone who might be on that's not a member of IJIC, 
you may join IGF and get all the emails that we send out and, and uh, membership stuff. Uh, there's a form in the chat that you can, and there's also the job uh, description that Neil was a uh, carpenter was talking about. I know we posted that job on the IGIC website. I'll have to check and see if it still is, Neil. I'll do that. And um, thank you very much, Jessica, for presenting. Um, anyone else? All no right. Problem, Micah. Oh, so Micah, the last thing that I want to mention, and I was going to save this to the last, is. Um, if you are a user of GIS Data Hub, you received notification that we were doing maintenance yesterday and then another one to tell you that it had been postponed till next Tuesday. Keep in mind um, that our team is constantly advancing GIS Data Hub. You will continue to receive those emails. We will notify you as soon as we know, but just keep in mind it's always done after hours. So if you do need to submit after hours just be mindful of that tuesday evening to early wednesday morning um downtime i think maybe a handful of times we have seen submissions after 5 p.m central or on the weekends but just keep in mind that um we're constantly working with you with the team to improve that and so um we will again see those once in a while but we'll always try to do them after hours if possible i will send out a reminder on monday just to remind you all that don't submit on tuesday evening so thank you micah for the opportunity and everyone who was on this call thank you very much and with that we'll uh, bid you all adieu on this uh, august lunch and learn our next lunch and learn i should always have this at my fingertips and i just don't will be on um september 20th um, so be looking for that in your email boxes and on the IJIC website on the topic, and I'll be sending that out hopefully pretty soon. Have a wonderful Wednesday.